The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Welcome to Politically Speaking Insights and Issues. I'm your host, Dave Selassie. If you've been paying any attention to the news for the last little while, you will have heard repeated reports about a new uh, novel coronavirus. Today, we know that more than five, nearly 5,000 people have died from this disease, with more than eight, 118,000 people infected. It's been found now in 114 countries, according to the World Health Organization. Today, we're gonna to be talking about this disease, its spread, and how you can keep you and your family safe. Now, because of the rapidly changing circumstances around uh, the news reports concerning COVID-19, I wanna make the disclaimer at the start of this show uh, that we are live on March the 12th, 2020. If you are watching a repeat, certain circumstances may have changed in the interim. We will give you links for updated information at the end of the show. So I just want to make sure that because things are so dynamic and so fluid, and we were talking earlier about, especially today, uh, stay attuned to what's been going on. My guest today, we're really pleased to welcome Dr. Fareen, Fareen Karachwala, the Associate Medical Officer of Health for York Region, Kareem, thank you very, very much for coming out tonight. And I'm not going to do my traditional handshake. Right, perfect. <laughs> thank you so much for having me on the show and to talk about this very important issue. Really appreciate it. Well, I, I really appreciate you being able to take the time because, mm -hmm. as I was mentioning in the intro comments, especially today, there's so much happening. So it's such a dynamic uh, uh, flux of events. But exactly. we want to get into all those. But first off, right. maybe let's just talk a little bit about yourself, if we could. Sure. Well, what is your own background? So I'm a public health physician, um, which basically means I have the great pleasure of getting to help support and lead a dedicated team of public health professionals at a public health unit in the region of uh, York. Um, so a, a lot of people may not be super familiar with what a public health doctor actually is, so maybe I can take a couple of seconds just to explain, you know, what our role is, yeah. um, especially would, in this changing time. Yeah, if you would please, because I, I think you're right, people don't pay very much attention to it right. until there's something dramatic that affects their lives like exactly. this is, like this coronavirus is. Right, right, absolutely. So uh, so we are a specialty, so just like you would have a nephrologist or a respirologist. You might want to include a nephrologist. Sure, so a kidney doctor <laughs> lung doctor. Um, we too are a specialty in medicine. Um, we essentially, our patient is not necessarily one individual in front of us, but the entire community. So for myself and my colleagues working at York Region Public Health, our patient, if you could say, is the entire community of York Region. So just like a individual clinician with the person in front of you would figure out what are your health issues, we look at the community as a whole and say, what's going on in our community? What are those um, main issues, whether it's chronic disease or the opioid crisis or tobacco or communicable diseases, of course, like this one, we help sort out what all is happening and what's the best response to it. So we would have training in things like outbreak management, epidemiology, um, leadership management to lead a health unit, um, communication, because a large part of what we do, of course, is public education, awareness raising, which for this crisis particularly is really mm -hmm quite important. Um, so that's what a public health physician is and does. Um, you know, some of us are also trained in family medicine, so I have a practice as well clinically, um, but my main focus day to day is really the health of the community, looking at who's most vulnerable, and how do we really put those systems and policies into place to make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity for good health. And before you came to York Region, you were doing the same role yeah, as, a, exactly. as Associate Medical Officer of Health in Kingston. Correct? I was, yes, at KFLNA Public Health. Um, and then I moved over to York Region just about a year and a half ago now and have been active in the communicable disease area in this health unit for a year and a half. And as you know, lots has been going on, um, particularly more recently with this COVID-19 
situation. Now, I'm just going to backtrack. We say yeah. communicable disease. Mm -hmm. What does that embrace? What does that encompass? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's most of our reportables. So those would be things like tuberculosis, um, measles, diphtheria, mumps, all of those things that you hear about a lot actually in the news. Um, and so say a person in the community has that, it's reportable to the public health authority, uh, and we would do various steps to control that kind of an outbreak. So more, most recently, you know, we're busy with things like measles or mumps, um, some of those vaccine preventable diseases that we hear about all the time as well. Uh, and that's been the main focus of my portfolio over the past year and a half. I know you were also the uh, featured student at the Dalalana School of Public Health. Yes, right. So I did graduate from the University of Toronto mm -hmm. from my residency program. And prior to that, because part of our training in public health is also doing a master's of public health degree. Um, so I was down in the States for that at Hopkins. Oh. And then prior to that, graduated medical school at Western. So that's a bit of my history and background there. I like one of yeah. the quotes that's uh, from the, uh, the School of Public Health from which you graduated. Yeah. If I can read it. Sure, sure. Uh, it really, because it's really relevant to our discussions today, I think. Right. Do not be afraid of politics and politicians. Mm -hmm. Policy and legislation is what drives our funding, programming and systems. We can't shy away from engaging in this domain because a lack of our voice means space for less informed, less evidence-driven voices. Mm -hmm. Have you, in your yeah. career, professional career, have you come to understand that quote even stronger? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's one thing when you're in school and you're learning about all these theoretical concepts, um, but once you're in the field, especially at a local public health unit where you're so embedded in the community and you have access to all the other departments, so, you know, we're very closely tied with social services and paramedics, and you really get those linkages and the understanding when you're trying to feed back into policy processes or um, figuring out systems for how things work, having that direct relationship and and uh, knowledge and link to what's actually happening in, in your community in terms of, you know, what are people worried about? What are their questions? What are the different health issues they're seeing and who might be more affected? Uh, actually seeing that front line and having those systems of communication is really helpful when you are talking about politics and policy making cycles and, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So having that local focus, for me at least, has been quite important. Because there is a real integration of public policy, politics exactly. and public health. Right, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So tell yeah. me, right now mm -hmm. especially with yeah. what's going on in terms of the COVID-19, What's a day in the life of Dr. Mm. Fareen Karchawala like these days? Yes. Oh, it's, it's busy times, let me tell you. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, it's great. We, I'm very, very fortunate to work with a fantastic team of public health professionals, so investigators, inspectors, public health nurses, who um, in our department, and I'm sure all across Canada, are really committed to what they do. They have the best interest of the public in mind, um, and they're very passionate about their work. So I'm extremely fortunate and thankful to all of our staff at York Region Public Health and the region at large, really, um, for everything that they do day to day. Uh, so my job and role as we kind of go through this rapidly evolving situation is our focus really is on case management. So when we do have a case of COVID-19, our main priority is to put a ring around the individual to make sure that it's not spreading to their family members and then whoever they're in contact with as well. So we are sort of on the phone, our staff are on the phone daily speaking to people. As soon as we know someone's positive, for instance, we will call them right away, do a very detailed um, gathering of information to figure out, you know, where have you been, who might you be in close contact with, and then prioritize phoning those individuals to say the proper advice. So in a lot of cases, that stay home um, so that they're not then spreading that further. So that's a huge focus of our response day to day right now. And I would say the second big focus is getting the info out there to the community. I think for a lot of people, this is a new situation uh, for scientists as well and physicians as well um, and for the public. And so people need to know, well, what is the updated guidance? What can I do to prevent um, further transmission to help curb the spread of this right now um, and what things 
should I be looking for? So getting that information out there to our community members is a huge focus of what we're doing. So whether that's mm -hmm. um, updating the website or, you know, getting out in front of the camera and, and telling everybody what the situation is and what we are concerned by is a huge day-to-day -day activity of mine as well. And I want to get into some of the specifics of that mm -hmm. in a bit, but maybe maybe let's just take a look at the disease itself yeah, for a moment sure. if we could. Yeah. And I want to ask you, you know, this is a class of viruses, coronaviruses. Exactly. What are those? What are coronaviruses? Mm -hmm. How does this virus compare to the common cold that's, that uh, some political people have made the reference to, right. or um, more severe diseases that we've had come through, like people mostly remember the SARS epidemic from a, a few years ago. Yeah, how, how does this virus compare? Yeah, so I mean, coronaviruses are a large class of viruses, so there's many, many different types of them. Uh, we are most familiar with them in medicine because a lot of them do cause the common cold. Uh, so, you know, they'll come, you get kind of a runny nose, sore throat, maybe a cough, takes a few weeks, you get better, not typically that serious. Um, unless you might have very, you know, you're quite elderly or have a lot of um, other medical issues. So those are things we see or tend to see anyways most winters. You know, they come and go, happens in the fall, winter season, um, and then sort of goes away. So that's the common cold, which is one type of coronavirus. And then, like I said, there are many other types. So um, SARS was another type of coronavirus, quite on the other spectrum. Uh, and different from what we're seeing with COVID-19. So SARS was uh, a lot more severe uh, in that it caused a lot more serious illness in people and led to death more often than, than what we're seeing with COVID-19. Um, COVID-19, again, uh, less serious in terms of severity of illness than SARS, um, but perhaps a little bit more easily spread. So, you know, in the SARS outbreak, it was a bit more localized certain countries had it but we weren't seeing what we're seeing with this where it's a more widespread in various parts of asia and europe um, a lot remains to be seen with this virus you know we're sort of learning about it more and more each day but i think one thing that i found really reassuring is that the difference in our knowledge um, from SARS and now is quite remarkable. So when mm. COVID-19 first started, the entire virus was, there was a test developed for it, the whole genome was sequenced within a couple of weeks of us even recognizing that an outbreak had occurred. Whereas in SARS, you know, things were going on for quite a long time without that understanding of what we're dealing with. So to me, that represents huge progress in the science and the public health response, which is quite remarkable, I think. But we don't, um, because it's an entirely new strain, mm -hmm. we don't have any existing immunities to that. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. That's kind of the assumption we're working on here is that because it's new, um, no one is, no one's immune system is necessarily familiar with it. So the way we get immunity or protection to a virus is either if you're immunized for it, so you have a vaccine, or uh, you're exposed to it. So, you know, you yourself might be exposed and get sick. So right now, because it's new, we are working on the assumption that no one actually has that protection unless you've, of course, had it already. And it seems to be affecting all ages now, mm -hmm. correct? But, but who is yeah. most susceptible? Yeah, so that's a great question. And we know from our Canadian figures, about 75% of cases have been over the age of 40. Um, so we are seeing a skew, you know, more towards people over the age of 40. Um, in terms of who we're most worried about, like who might actually have a more serious outcome from it, that would be people over age 65, um, people who might have a pre-existing medical condition, or maybe their immune system is down because they might be on some immune suppressing medications like prednisone, things like that, or maybe their cancer, um, so their immune system is challenged. So those individuals are who we're most concerned about in terms of getting sick from it, very sick from it. Now, the World Health Organization has declared mm -hmm. this worldwide outbreak to be a pandemic. Right. What does that mean? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, because I know, I know this is a recent development. Um, people are wondering, like, does that mean, you know, we're more at risk? Should we panic? Um, and the reality is, before that declaration was made, we knew that there was transmission occurring in different parts of the world. So that was already occurring in, you know, Italy, in Iran, in uh, various other places in both Asia and Europe. So 
the risk didn't change right before that declaration compared to right after that declaration. And so a lot of actually, um, there's so many different factors that go into why a pandemic is declared. And we're going to have to pick up yes, on this. Sounds the good. Break. Stay with us, please. We're going to come back and talk about how you can protect yourself. This is Politically Speaking. Thank you very much. No problem. You want to say... Back to Politically Speaking Insights and Issues. I'm your host, Dave Selassie, and we're talking about the COVID-19 virus with Dr. Fareen Kirchawala from the uh, York Region Department of Health. And I want to put a reminder out here to people that are viewing this as a repeat that we did record this show on March the 12th so that certain uh, situations, conditions may have changed since we initially broadcast uh, this show. Watch at the end for any updates and how to find out the updates. When we went to break, we were talking about uh, the World Health Organization declaring COVID-19 now as a pandemic. Right. And we're talking about what that actually means to, to us. Right, exactly. And the reality is here in York Region, we aren't seeing community spread. All of our cases are linked back to travel. And so it doesn't change our risk here in York Region, in Ontario or Canada. I just want to be really clear on this point that you're saying right now. Yes. To this point, there's been no no cases have, have developed because of people within York Region mm -hmm. passing it to each other. They've exactly. all had their contact outside the country. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Every person has had a travel history um, where, you know, they got it abroad. They didn't get it here in York Region. So that's very reassuring for us. And actually, Ontario-wide, that's the case as well. There's one case being investigated, but outside of that, we aren't seeing a multitude of cases where people have gotten it locally, which is very reassuring. So the whole pandemic thing, it doesn't change our risk here. It's a way to signal to other countries that may need some more financial support and to garner those resources worldwide doesn't change our risk here locally. Okay. So how many, at this point in time, mm -hmm. realizing this number can change, but yes. how many cases do we have in New York region? So we have eight in York Region to date, and again, really want to emphasize they all have links back to the affected areas. So mostly Iran and a few in Egypt, and that's all that we've been reporting on acquired abroad. Okay, how is York Region Health preparing mm -hmm. in case this becomes a community-based uh, transmission? Yeah, so we are in constant communication with our ministry partners, with our federal That's the partners. the Ontario Ministry of Health. Ontario Ministry of Health, exactly. Mm -hmm. We all work as, as part of a large system with different roles to play. Um, so here locally, we also have a very strong relationship with the three hospitals in York Region, uh, work very closely with them, and really... Um, message out and also get this two-way communication with our local health care providers because it's them that report suspect cases to us so we can monitor, keep track, see how things are changing. So that's something we're doing daily. Um, we're also preparing by thinking ahead to what may come, um, preparing for the health sector and saying, you know, if you do see an increased number of cases, how will we cope as a system? Um, where are the pressure points and how can we relieve those as much in advance as possible? Uh, so all those plans are underway. They're underway provincially, they're underway locally, uh, and that activity has been going on for, for quite a long time now actually let's talk about transmission for a bit if we can too yeah. so how is the virus transmitted mm -hmm. yes yeah, so it's transmitted and again we're learning more every day but now that it's been around for a little while we have a good understanding of this it's transmitted through what we call droplet and contact so what that means is if I'm an infected person uh, and I cough or I sneeze uh, and that somehow gets on to you as another individual in your eyes or your mouth it has to be like on a, on a mucal it. membrane exactly right? a mucal membrane so nose into your mouth into your eyes um, that's how it's transmitted so whether you know if we're talking face to face and I'm sort of spewing out a little it could go directly onto your mucous membranes um, or you know a, a lot of the transmission we're seeing is really among close contacts so if you live in a household with someone you're much more likely to have that you know 
respiratory droplets sort of spewing and getting right directly into another person. Um, we're not seeing this casually, so we're not seeing, so say you're, I'm a positive case and I'm in a mall, we're not seeing everybody in the mall now infected the way you would with something like measles, for example, which is very different. Mm -hmm. It's really that close interaction, you know, we're face to face for 10, 15 minutes. Um, there's a higher chance of my respiratory droplets and things like that getting onto yours. So it really is that close face-to-face -face interaction that we're worried about. I, I was looking at something. That, how long can the virus remain viable then outside a human host? Mm -hmm. I was looking at a study from the National yeah. Institute of Health in the United States and right. Princeton University, and they were talking about three hours in the air mm -hmm. or up to three days on some surfaces. Right, exactly. So, I mean, there is a range, that's for sure, uh, and more and more studies are being done every day, and the estimates are large. So, yeah, some are saying a few hours, some are saying a few days, uh, and that's why we're telling people, you know, when they're asking, what can I do to protect myself, it's definitely about washing your hands uh, and that respiratory etiquette so my droplets don't get onto yours, but it's also about cleaning your surfaces. So, very commonly touched surfaces like a doorknob or a light switch um, or those kinds of things that we're touching every day, your cell phone, that kind of thing. Um, cleaning those often, like twice a day with regular household cleaner, um, that's really important too. So it was, it was, yeah, looking at plastic and stainless steel seem to be the most hospitable mm -hmm. surfaces for the virus. And I was thinking yeah. handrails yeah, in, absolutely. In, in public transit via... Absolutely, yeah, and there's some great guidance um, also on our website that links to if you're in a workplace, what's the best thing to do? And it really is that cleaning those handrails and those doorknobs and the surfaces that you touch all the time, like tabletops, uh, regularly, and do that with a cleaner, a disinfectant. The usual household products is, is effective. Now, correct me, but to date, mm -hmm. as far as I understand, there's no evidence that companion animals or pets can spread the COVID-19 virus. Is that correct? Yeah, so all the studies on this are very preliminary. So it's possible that an animal could get infected, but actually spreading it between other people, that's not as clear. So, you know, we do say if you are a person who is experiencing respiratory, experiencing respiratory symptoms or you're a case yourself or being worked up as a case, you know, maybe you've gotten tested, um, try to avoid that very close contact with your pets. So the face-to-face, -face, the kissing, the constant touching, um, try to avoid that. But right now we're not seeing evidence that a pet could be transmitting it to other people, nothing like that. Okay. Because some people make the objection that, well, mm -hmm. didn't this virus come from animals in the first place? So can they still be carrying it back back to humans. Right, and I think that's a, a different situation when we're talking about sort of our household cat or dog um, versus the theories of where it might have come from in a more wild source and markets and different things where different types of interactions are happening between humans and animals. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you're a case, try to avoid that direct contact. Um, otherwise, we're not that worried about pets being a source of spread or anything at this point. Now, I've got a yeah. direct question from a viewer from by email. Oh, yes. And it's more of a medical question than a public health, I think, though. But sure. The question is, what treatment do COVID-19 cases admitted to hospital mm -hmm. receive? And if, the case, if their case is positive but they're not admitted, mm -hmm. what treatments, if any, are recommended at home? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So like many viruses, actually, uh, a lot of the treatment is what we call supportive, which means, you know, like if you have the common cold, especially if you're not admitted to hospital, meaning it's not that you require a stay in hospital or ICU or anything like that, then we recommend what we actually usually do for the common cold, which is drink lots of fluids, get rest, all those things that boost your immune system. And then if you want to take the occasional Advil or Tylenol to help control pain or fever, then that's very appropriate. But it really is about fluid, rest, hydration. Um, there are, for people in very serious circumstances, maybe they're in the ICU or you're admitted to hospital, some experimental 
uh, what we call antiretrovirals that are tried. So, you know, with flu, there's a viral treatment. Mm -hmm. So drugs similar to that are being tested and researched very heavily right now. Did I read that one of the um, HIV antiretroviral mm -hmm. Uh, medications were being uh, tested. Yeah, exactly. So they're being looked at as well because HIV is also a virus and so the thought is that the way it works for HIV it could also be maybe effective for COVID-19. So all those things are very quickly being researched, tested, experimented, um, but for the general person at home let's say it's really about that rest um, drinking lots of fluids, taking that Advil and Tylenol when you need it. Grandma's chicken soup recipe? Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Doc, Dr. Kareem Kurji is the mm -hmm. Medical Officer of Health for York Region. Yes. I guess uh, you, you work closely with Dr. Kurji. Absolutely, yes. Uh, he has said that the risk is low in the York Region. Right. So how do we know that the virus is not circulating in the mm -hmm. community? Yeah, so we have a, a very strong public health system in York Region, in Ontario and Canada. We have great health system partners, a very solid, robust system. Um, so we know because when somebody presents to healthcare and they, you know, they think somebody has the infection, then it's they report it to us. So we know all suspect cases. We're monitoring that. We're tracking that. As soon as we know somebody is positive, we're literally on the phone with them right away and we get a clear sense of where they would have gotten it from. So we're confident here in York Region that we haven't seen that indication of widespread community transmission here because all of our cases in York Region are linked back to travel. So they've acquired it abroad. They've not acquired, acquired it just, you know, walking around the mall here um, locally. And of course, I imagine you are in constant communication mm -hmm. with uh, with um, departments of health in other municipalities mm -hmm. and other provinces. Yes, you're yeah. checking on that. Yeah, exactly. There's really strong surveillance systems, right? So the the uh, Ontario Ministry of Health, uh, Public Health Agency of Canada, all these large bodies are constantly monitoring the data, monitoring the information. Um, one really neat thing that's happening in Ontario is they're testing people who. Um, maybe haven't even traveled, so they're just doing swabs here and there for people that are in hospital just to check that they, there isn't someone without that link. So it's called sentinel surveillance, mm -hmm. um, but it's sort of that broader testing, so we're able to pick up, you know, maybe you're focused on one country and you're ignoring another country, but they're picking up, even if someone hasn't traveled, they're going to get swabbed so that we know early on if there is that tr transmission happening in Ontario or York Region. So. What steps, other than mm -hmm. the things you've been mentioning as we're going mm -hmm. through, what steps can York Region residents take to protect themselves at yes. this point in time? Yes, yeah, so I'm very glad you asked that question. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, government has a role to play, but so does the uh, general member of the public. And so we really want people to be vigilant because we can curb this, we can delay uh, and prevent people from getting sick. So one of the most important messages that I really want people to know is if you are feeling unwell, stay home. Um, I know it's not always the easiest thing to do, but do not go to work, do not go to school if you have symptoms like a fever or a cough or a runny nose. Um, it's really important to stay home and not spread that onwards. Um, the other thing we want people to do, of course, and I know this is not always the most exciting message, but it's really about washing your hands. And we say that because it's hard to limit what you touch, hard to not touch your face, but when you're washing your hands, you're really breaking that chain of transmission. And so doing that often, doing it well, is very important. Uh, and, and then we were saying sing happy birthday twice. Yes, <laughs> right. Yeah, singing happy birthday, counting Mississippis. Um, we want people to wash their hands for at least 20 seconds, get into those crevices. You know, you sometimes do it really quickly, but what you want to do is do it thoroughly. Go under the nails, get the wrist area, uh, soap and water, perfect option. Um, the alcohol-based sanitizer is a good quick alternative, um, but soap and water traditionally uh, is really great, especially when there's actual, you know, visibly soiled hands that you see. Um, so that's very, very important. And then, of course, being very mindful of if you are coughing or sneezing, doing that into your uh, elbow, not using your hands, um, and making sure you're washing after. Um, but I really want people to also pay attention to the travel advice. So uh, go on the Government of Canada website. You can get the link through our website as well, york.ca slash COVID-19, um, and check the travel advisory and really pay attention to what you do when before you go, but also when you return. 
So when you return, it's very important to be vigilant. So watch for signs and symptoms. Um, make sure to stay home as soon as you are feeling anything and then seek health care. Um, right now, the advice is if you're coming back from Iran or Hubei or Italy, that actually when you come home, you stay home in a self-isolated way, so in sort of quarantine, if you want to call it that, for 14 days. Okay. And I do want to come into, in our next segment, talking yes. about how we can control, how we can encourage that. So Great. stay with us here on Politically Speaking, and we'll talk more about the COVID-19 virus. Politically Speaking, Insights and Issues. I'm your host, Dave Selassie, and my guest today is Dr. Farine Karachiwala, who's the Associate Medical Officer of Health for York Region. Um, and we're talking about the COVID-19 virus. And just as we went to break, we were talking about uh, ways people can protect themselves and their families against uh, receiving the infection. Mm -hmm. One of the tools we see people using around, and I want to ask you about this, doctor, mm -hmm. is people wearing masks. Right. What is the advisability? What is the recommendation surrounding masks? Mm -hmm. Or is it something that just gives people a very bad false sense of security? Yeah, no, I'm very glad you asked that question. So uh, Dr. Teresa Tam, who is Canada's chief public health officer, put out some really great advice around masks. Uh, so if you're well, so you know you don't have a fever, or no cough, runny nose, things like that, a mask is really not that helpful. Um, Firstly, the mask, if it's a surgical mask, needs to fit you properly. So it actually has to cover both your nose and mouth. Um, and then also what it does is, if you're well, is it makes you keep touching your face, you know? So you might be readjusting, you might be taking on and off. And so really all you're doing is touching your face more, which could actually be a risk. Uh, and then that it, it could provide a false sense of security. So we're recommending that if you're well, that you don't need that mask. And in fact, it could make things worse if you're wearing it all the time. And if you're unwell and you're using this out of politeness for others? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're unwell, I mean, again, the message is stay home as much as possible and really try to limit your interaction with other people. If there's a scenario where you really, you know, have to be around someone or whatever it is, or maybe you're going to seek care, then yeah, wearing a properly fitted mask makes sense and the best thing to do is wash your hands before you put it on mm. after you take it off wash your hands make sure you're disposing of it properly and be very careful that it actually is a good fit for you um, but otherwise if you're well not we're not endorsing that. I don't think it's helpful at this at this time. And, and if I only thing I have around are the dusks masks, dust mm -hmm. masks that I use while I'm sanding at my workbench. That's mm -hmm. no help at all. No, I mean it would it would need to really fit properly. And again, if you're well, we definitely wouldn't recommend that. I think again, if you're feeling ill, best thing to do stay home, be really vigilant about who you're around, and avoiding contact with people who might be more at risk, like you know elderly individuals people who are medically unwell or might have other chronic conditions, that's the best thing to do. Mm. Let's talk, we'll move into questions about testing if we can. Yeah. So what, what role is testing playing now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so great question. So we are, we are still testing people because we do want to pick up at this point in time cases so that, like we said, we can put a ring around the case very quickly. So it is really important that people that are positive at this stage are identified because we are still in what's called containment mode, meaning we are putting a ring around every person that's positive. Um, and that's very appropriate for this stage because we aren't in York region seeing this widespread community transmission everywhere like we might be in other parts of the world. Um, so it is very important to get tested. Uh, right now, the recommendation for testing is um, if you've returned from international travel, or you've had contact with a case of COVID-19 or someone who you think has COVID-19 uh, and you yourself are unwell, so that means you have a fever, a cough, shortness of breath, then testing is very appropriate and you should seek care to get that test. Okay. Where? 
Now, people say, okay, I should get tested. Mm -hmm. that, that's fine, but if I don't know how to get that test, it's yes. not very helpful information. Yes, Where exactly. can I get tested? Yeah, so I, it's different in different communities. So in some places, you might be able to go to your family doctor. In a lot of places, the place for testing is the emergency department um, because they have the equipment, the sort of supplies that you need to undergo the testing. Um, this, of course, is, is causing a, a strain on our emergency departments. Um, who mm -hmm. are who are you know great partners of ours and are working really hard around the clock to manage and still the situation with cases as well. exactly and all the other emergencies that are coming through their door like a heart attack right so we are encouraging people that if you're well like you don't have any symptoms don't go to the eMERGE inquiring about testing because it really does cause quite a backlog um, but right now locally a lot of the testing is still occurring in the emergency departments um, because of the equipment and the supplies. So we're asking people, you know, if you're really unsure, call telehealth, um, seek out that kind of advice. Um, but really, the testing predominantly is still occurring in the emergency departments. Though, on the horizon, of course, are um, these assessment centers, which people might have heard. Yeah, yeah I want to ask you about those. Kind of, kind of mm -hmm. like you drive through uh, coronavirus right, tests. Right. <laughs> yeah. You want fries with them? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Sorry, bad <laughs> joke. Um, yeah, I mean, those solutions are, are very actively being planned, being looked at. You might have seen in the news today that a range of assessment centers are being planned to open imminently across the province. And that really is to relieve some of the pressure on the emergency department so it's a center dedicated just for um, looking at people who might be unwell specific testing for COVID-19 so that the emergency departments can also um, sort of get on with seeing their very urgent cases mm -hmm. um, that of course they need to do. So in York Region Mackenzie Health mm -hmm. is becoming a um, uh, an assessment center. Mm -hmm. but what about these uh, more informal centers that are more accessible in communities? Mm -hmm. Is your department involved at all in setting any of those up? Mm -hmm. Yes, so we, we are having discussions with other partners. I mean, the main role for the health unit is um, should the assessment centers open or be planned and know about through the hospitals, that we would be involved in communicating that to the public so people know where to go, who do I call, that kind of advice. Um, and we'd also be doing the follow up for those people that are tested so that you know if somebody becomes a case again we're stepping in right away to put a ring around those contacts we're calling people at high risk um, and providing some of that advice around self-isolation and what exactly does that mean for a person mm. now a recent article in the Georgina Advocate was quoting mm. um, uh, Dr. Teresa Tam as you mentioned uh, Canada's chief medical officer mm -hmm. that uh, we have to prepare for a pandemic mm -hmm. and with what does that preparation entail uh, an yeah. unclear but one of the suggestions in the article advised people to stock up on prescription medications mm -hmm. now but I've read elsewhere that that's not terribly helpful because I could deprive others of necessary yeah. medications uh, how, how are right. you advising people on that response yeah, no, that's a great question and, and one we're getting a lot of. So, I mean, for most situations anyways, we advise that people have, you know, two or three days worth of supplies because you never know when any emergency could hit. So be it an ice storm that could happen anytime. Um, that kind of having, you know, maybe two days, three days of food and medications and that kind of stuff available is just good practice sort of all year round anyways. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you have a chronic medical condition and maybe you're on a long-standing medication, it's always prudent and make sure you have enough and you're not, you know, a day or two out and going to run out and then have to sort of urgently seek an appointment. But you're not talking two but or we're three not, months. No, no, and we're not talking about that in terms of supplies and things like that. One of the article was to talk to your insurance company to see right. if they would allow you to have extended amounts. And I'm going, Really? Yeah, and, and again, I want to reiterate that in York Region and Ontario, we're not seeing a whole number of cases where we can't link it back anywhere and there's spread happening everywhere. Like, we're not at that point yet. Um, so, you know, be diligent about if you have a chronic condition, make sure you have enough meds like you would any other time. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not saying, you know, stock up on six months of supplies here at this at this point in time. Okay. Yeah. Now, Dr. Kurji. Uh, again, the uh, York Region's medical officer mm -hmm. suggested that there was a risk posed mm -hmm. by large scale events mm -hmm. that in, in his recent uh, video that he did. Yeah. Now, we're coming into a season yeah. of some pretty major religious holidays yeah. with Good Friday, Passover, Easter, Hindu New Year's. Mm -hmm. Is the department, are you suggesting 
that these kind of celebrations, religious celebrations, should perhaps be cancelled. Mm -hmm. So what, what we are suggesting, and actually the, the Public Health Agency of Canada put out some very solid guidance in this regard. And so what we're telling people is it's not a blanket ban all these events. Um, again, we're not seeing that widespread transmission, but we are asking people to be diligent, to assess the risk of their event, and if you're an organizer, to really put into place what you can, or consider cancelling if you can't, uh, those things that will lower the risk of a big event. So if you can make that event smaller and maybe have a series of events, or if you have a large gathering, again, having more centres so it ends up being smaller, um, and maybe thinking about limiting the time that the event is going on for, um, making sure those supplies are available, like the hand sanitizer, the sinks, those kinds of things. Um, so there's really great guidance. Again, you can find it on a link to it on our website as well. And we do encourage people who are planning these events to be really thoughtful, to be mindful, read that guidance and, and consider it. And very importantly, if you're a member of the public and you're feeling ill, don't go to a large event, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and if it's event with you know, a, a high amount of seniors, for example, that is a higher risk situation. Which often is part and parcel of a lot of the religious celebrations. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Exactly. So even for businesses, you know, we are saying maybe start looking into those telecommuting options and working from home. And those are all um, great things to start looking into. Yeah. You know, Dr. Kurji yeah. suggested that singing was one of the ways the... Uh, Virus can be transmitted right. to water droplets. Yeah. So yeah. having an Easter celebration without people singing the, right. the Alleluia chorus might be hard. Right, right. So right now, mm -hmm. as, and they, once again, I say this was recorded March 12th. Things are going to be changing. Exactly. But as of this point in time, the NBA, mm -hmm. National Basketball Association, has suspended the current season. Right. NHL has now suspended uh, games yes. for the foreseeable future. Um, we've had the U.S. President Donald Trump suspending travel from Europe for non-U.S. citizens. Yeah. Um, we've had Angela Merkel, mm -hmm. the Chancellor of Germany, suggest that uh, the virus is likely to infect up to 70% of the German population. Mm -hmm. Italy and Denmark are now closed mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes. A uh, number of universities, including Laurentian here in Ontario, have cancelled classes. Yeah. CDC is talking about an expectation of 30 million cases. Mm -hmm. Ontario now mm -hmm. has extended March break, right. closed schools for the next three weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How far can Ontario's health authorities go mm -hmm. to stop the coronavirus? Mm -hmm. You were using earlier on, and when you were referring to, you were talking about confining, confining the virus, confining right. people. Right. How extensive are those rights Mm -hmm. for the to protect the public at large mm -hmm. yeah i mean you know these are these are tough questions there are things that require a lot of thought and so many considerations so um i mean i want to start by saying that we work as a system right so at the local level our main role is to put a ring around contact. So when I'm talking about self-isolating an individual um, or asking them to stay home, that's when we have one case and we're talking about individuals that the case has come into contact with. Um, then we have the Ministry of Health in Ontario, who um, is the one advising on things like closures of publicly funded schools in the province, right? So those decisions rest with the provincial government. And then we have the federal government, who it's their role to make the advice around travel, banning flights, like all those types of measures that deal with international partners rests with the federal government. So these decisions always have to be considered. Like I said, locally in Ontario, we aren't seeing that widespread transmission the way they are seeing in Italy and other parts of Europe. That's not happening here. Um, but it's prudent to start thinking about what could those measures be. I think the other thing we really have to keep in mind is it's a very tough balancing act. Um, and you also want to be mindful of the social determinants of health mm -hmm. as well, right? So if um, everything is shut down and it's very risky, 
restrictive and the economy <laughs> collapses. I mean, those are things that have a huge impact on an individual's well-being as well. So these decisions are not made lightly. A lot of thought, a lot of consideration go into it. And mostly they are made at the provincial and federal level versus, you know, our, ourselves uh, locally here. Um, but we're in a very strong system and I have a lot of faith in our provincial colleagues and our federal guidance and our scientists there that are advising every day. So I think it's interesting because we're in this sort of period where we aren't seeing that transmission. Other places are and they are putting into place those measures. So it will be a bit of a gradual process, see, where, see when and where things happen. Um, but you are seeing that already, right, with the cancellation, so the extending March break and things like that, which are prudent things to be doing right now. When we come back, mm -hmm. I want to ask you about more about the powers of the regional uh, Department of Health. Mm -hmm. But stay with us on Politically Speaking as they come back to talk more about the COVID-19 virus. Thanks for staying with us here on Politically Speaking, Insights and Issues. I'm your host, Dave Selassie. I'm in conversation with Dr. Fareen Kirchawala from the uh, York Region Department of Health. And we were just ending up in the last section talking about the powers that the regional Department of Health have. Mm -hmm. And because we talked about people being in quarantine, does the department have the power to order someone mm -hmm. into quarantine? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I mean, we, we do have that power, and that's existed for quite a long time when it comes to any communicable disease. Um, for this crisis, we haven't had to use that. People are being very diligent and responsible, which is excellent. They are staying home. Uh, many of our cases, actually, uh, once they got sick, they stayed home, and that makes our job of putting a ring around the contacts really easy and makes the transmission possibility much less likely. So, I mean, that power exists, but we are finding that when people have that call to action, they know to stay home, they know to do those protective measures, it makes a world of difference. So one of the things you would have studied, I'm sure, in, in public health mm -hmm. is uh, the ethical criteria that needs to be met in cases like that. Yeah. Uh, how do we justify restrictive measures? balancing the overriding Absolutely. of civil liberties and the obligations for those asking for these restrictions. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as we talked about, I mean, the measures that we put into place, they have to match the severity of the situation. And we do have to be mindful of the huge impact that has on every aspect of someone's life. And in the region of York, we're really fortunate to be closely tied with our social service partners so that if we do have situations where a person maybe can't get food or they can't um, find other social supports that they really need while they're in isolation. We have those links with the department. We can draw on those other supports and help someone get through that process because it's not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. And we, we know We that. have a caller live right now. Mm -hmm. Can we go to her? Jennifer, sure. are you on the line here now? Yes. Hello, Jennifer? Yes. Okay, hi. Uh, you have a question for our guest here. I do. Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, my parents are snowbirds, and so they are in that difficult decision right now of deciding what they should be doing. And I'm not sure whether you have any recommendations, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we see travel bans in the U.S. for, for Europe. You see that Canada is, is making the same consideration, but mm -hmm. there's no comments about snowbirds who are currently in Florida, mm -hmm. whether they should be coming home, whether a border might be closing, mm -hmm. um, what the best thing for them to do is. So I didn't know yeah. whether you had any recommendations for them. Great. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Great. Dr. Kirchwell? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a great question. Uh, <coughs> the Public Health Agency of Canada, like I said, the Government of Canada, has put out some really solid advice about if you're thinking of traveling, what are all the travel advisories? Now, I know your question is if someone is already abroad and they come back. So the very important message here is if you have returned from any international travel, be really mindful for 14 days after you return about watching for any signs or symptoms. So if they develop, 
develop like a fever or a cough or anything like that, that you seek care right away and that you really, as soon as that happens, distance yourself from other people. So you're not going to large events, you're avoiding people that might be elderly or have medical conditions, but it's being very vigilant when you return from travel and mindful of all that advice. And you can check that out on our website as well at york.ca slash COVID-19 and it links you to those appropriate pages. And, and you, you've stressed a number of times mm -hmm. people uh, not going into work, not going to events if they feel um, any symptoms whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And you want to just name those symptoms again? Absolutely. So the ones we're worried about are fever, cough, shortness of breath. And shortness of breath is particularly unique to this virus, I understand, mm -hmm. too, rather than it's, it's not a characteristic of the flu for example. Yeah, it can be, um, but we are seeing that as a prominent symptom here, um, but it, it can occur with other sort of respiratory viruses, including influenza or the flu. It yeah. certainly would be very helpful for working people if the mm -hmm. province would restore the, uh, the, the two fully paid sick leave days mm -hmm. that uh, people did enjoy up to this government uh, withdrawing those. Mm -hmm. Is there any pressure from the from the health departments around the country to ask the government to review that decision to take away those paid sick days from people yeah. who, who may be in a situation where they don't have a choice exactly. to, to go to work or not to yeah. because of the social pressures you're talking about. Right, and it's an important thing to keep in mind because it doesn't affect everybody equally. So if you aren't getting the pay for those 14 days, it can be very problematic. So a lot of discussion has happened, a lot of attention paid to this issue, um, and even more can be done. I know the federal government has worked to expedite some of the processes for EI, and that could be really helpful too. But it's so important to us that people aren't uh, losing their jobs or losing huge amounts of income because like I said that has a huge impact on health as well and how health is distributed in our communities. Well we, we know for the bulk of the population we've talked about this on a previous show mm -hmm. how people especially if in the in the if, especially if they are in precarious employment exactly they're just one paycheck away from from personal financial disaster. Exactly, and that's what we're worried about is it's not an equal spread, you know, who it impacts. It could be much worse if, you're, if you are in precarious employment or you are uh, making a lower income. So those protections uh, are very important. One thing I want to touch on with you before we close, um, it's been happening that the Ontario government has been pushing for consolidation mm -hmm. or canceling of public health agencies across the province. How is that impacting upon the current response to this crisis now? Right. So, so the provincial government has announced a pause on those reviews and those changes. Um, and you know, in, in our stance in York Region has always been that that relationship with the region is so fundamental, and we've seen that so clearly work well with the public health response, being connected to the region, being connected to paramedics and social services. And we're winding up once yes. again. Dr. Kirchhoff, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was no so problem. timely to be there. We should have on the screen, if people need additional information, yes. update information, where do they go? York.ca slash COVID-19. Brilliant, and thank that's on so the screen much. right now. Perfect. And this has been Politically Speaking, Insights and Issues. Thank you very, very much for walking, watching. Thank you very, very much for coming again, taking Thanks the so busy much. time out of your busy, busy schedule right yes. now. And thanks to the crew for the show. See you next time.